Welcome again to the tutorials on dynamic system modeling and control. Once, my, once again, my name is Hossam Fathi, and I'm uh, very happy that you're joining me on this tutorial. The uh, topic of this tutorial is the state space modeling of simple thermal systems. And uh, we have three goals that we need to uh, accomplish in this tutorial. Uh, the first one is uh, I'd like to explore with you the fundamental analogies between mechanical, electrical, and thermal systems. So far in these tutorials, we've explored the fun fundamental analogies between mechanical and electrical systems. We're going to be adding thermal systems to the mix. The uh, second goal of this tutorial is to see dissipation as a coupling effect between thermal dynamics and the dynamics of other domains. And the third goal of the tutorial is to derive a state space model for a simple thermal system. So without further ado, uh, moving on to the first goal, which is exploring fundamental analogies between mechanical, electrical, and thermal systems. I am specifically interested in two types of analogies. First of all, the fundamental analogies between signals in those domains. And secondly, the fundamental analogies between some of the basic components in those domains. So I want to start by recalling the fundamental analogies between signals in these domains. Um, and remember, in our bond graph inspired um, listing of fundamental analogies between these domains, we divided signals into flow signals and effort signals. So when we compare mechanical, electrical, and thermal systems, the first question I want to ask is what are the flow variables? What variables represent flow or motion? We've already said that in a mechanical system, the variable representing flow or motion is usually a speed or a velocity in a translational system or a, an angular speed or an angular velocity in a rotational system. We've also already said that the variable that represents flow or motion in an electrical system is current, and that the variable um, um, that represents now the, fundam the fundamentally analogous variable that represents flow in a thermal system, uh, you know, if you think about what uh, constitutes motion in a thermal system, in a system that uh, where the main form of energy storage is heat energy storage, thermal energy storage, um, you know, the, the, it makes sense to, to potentially think about heat flow rate as the flow variable. And so that's going to be our analogous variable or our flow variable, at least for now. Now, I've put a question mark in front of heat flow rate as a flow variable because um, I want to come back and question whether this is the best choice. And you'll see why in a second. So we've discussed flow variables. And now we move on to effort variables. An effort variable is a variable that represents a force that forces motion to happen, that induces motion. So uh, when you think about effort variables, what causes things to accelerate in a mechanical system? What causes things to accelerate or decelerate, to move? The effort variable in a mechanical system is usually a force or a torque, a force for a translational mechanical system or a torque for a rotational mechanical system. Similarly, in a, an electrical system, what causes current to flow, what induces current, what pushes electrons to move um, is uh, an electromotive force or, in other words, a voltage. If you think about a thermal system and what causes heat to flow in a thermal system from one object to another, it's usually a temperature difference between these objects, perhaps a linear uh, temperature difference or even a di difference between temperature to the power of four. So uh, it makes sense, for, for example, for radiation heat transfer. Um, the radiation heat transfer is usually a function of the difference between temperature raised to the power of four. Um, so if you think about um, what, it ma what makes sense as an effort variable in a thermal system, uh, basically, temperature or temperature difference makes sense as, a, as an effort variable. And again, I've put a question mark in front of that. Now, the reason for these question marks is the following. I would like to explore with you what it means to have a unified theory for the modeling of dynamic systems from different energy domains. Um, you know, to have a unified language for the modeling of dynamic systems from different energy domains, whether we're talking mechanical, electrical, or thermal. Um, in such a theory, it would be nice to have as many commonalities between the different domains as possible. Now, if you notice, the product of force and velocity has units of power. The product of torque and angular velocity has units of power. The product of voltage and current has units of power, watts, if you're using SI units. 
But the product of temperature and heat flow rate, or temperature difference and heat flow rate, has units of temperature multiplied by power. So we're losing something here. We're losing the idea that the product of flow and effort always equals power. Okay? And in the formal bond graph modeling language, there is an argument to be made for selecting flow and effort variables that actually do multiply to give power. In these tutorials, I'm going to adopt the slightly simpler mindset that it is okay for heat flow rate to be our flow variable and temperature difference to be our effort variable because temperature difference is what drives heat flow rate. So it's okay to adopt these as flow and effort, okay? With the understanding that perhaps there is a different choice of flow and effort variables that guarantees perhaps a bit more the, the commonality between these different energy domains. So I'm going to leave you with this question as a piece of food for thought. In a unified mechanism or environment or, or language for modeling dynamic systems, uh, at least energetic dynamic systems, does the product of flow and effort variables always have to have units of power? And if it does, what would you pick as units, as, as flow and effort variables in a thermal system to guarantee that this condition is met? So we've talked so far about fundamental analogies between signals in these different energetic systems. Now the next thing I want to talk about is fundamental analogies between the basic building blocks, the basic components in these energetic systems, or at least some of these basic components. I want to talk about resistors, generalized resistors in the mechanical domain, in the electrical domain, and in the thermal domain. And I want to talk about generalized capacitors in the mechanical, electrical, and thermal domain. So let's begin with the concept of a generalized capacitor. What is a generalized capacitor? What law does a generalized capacitor have to satisfy? A generalized capa capacitor is a device where effort is a static function of the time integral of flow. For example, in a mechanical world, effort is force and flow is velocity. It's a device that gives you a force that is a static function of the time integral of velocity. Of course, the time integral of velocity is displacement, and therefore a generalized capacitor in the mechanical world is a device that gives you a force that is proportional or related statically to displacement, which uh, would be a spring. Okay. In the electrical world, a generalized capacitor is a capacitor because uh, in the electrical world, effort is voltage, flow is current, and so you need a device that gives you voltage as a static function of the time integral of current. The time integral of current is charge, and a device that gives you a static relationship between voltage and charge is a capacitor. In the thermal world, we just said that um, we would like temperature to be our effort variable, and we would like heat flow rate to be our flow variable. So I would like to have a device that gives me temperature as a static function of the integral of heat flow rate. Now the time integral of heat flow rate is essentially the amount of heat stored in a system, or the amount of thermal energy stored in a system. And um, if you want a device whose temperature is proportional to the amount of thermal energy, or at least statically related to the amount of thermal energy stored in the system, you're essentially thinking about a thermal storage device, a thermal energy storage device. Okay. And uh, to illustrate this a little further, let me take this equation, or not equation, but this, this idea, this statement, the temperature has to be a static function of the time integral of flow rate. Let me take the derivative of both sides of this statement. What I'm saying here is then that the rate of change of temperature with respect to time is a, a function, a static function, not of the integral of heat flow rate anymore, but of just heat flow rate. So as y you gain or lose heat, the rate of change of your internal temperature rises or falls in proportion to the net rate at which you gain or lose heat. Of course, this looks like uh, the governing equation for a thermal storage device. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Let's think of a hot water tank. And let's think of this hot water tank as receiving heat from the outside world with a net heat flow rate Q of T. This is the net rate, so if the hot water tank is both you know, gaining and losing heat, um, the net flow rate of heat, the total gained minus lost, is Q of T. Okay? And essentially we understand that if this hot water tank is at a constant pressure, the mass of the hot water tank 
multiplied by the specific heat capacity of the hot water tank, Cp, multiplied by the rate of change of its temperature with respect to time, from thermodynamics, we know that that is equal to Q of T, that that is equal to the heat flow rate into the tank. This relationship is a static relationship between the time derivative of temperature on the one hand and the heat, uh, net heat flow rate on the other hand. So that the hot water tank acts as a thermal capacitor. I want you to notice something really interesting here, which is that in, when we talk about um, this hot water tank with each other as engineers, um, sort of, uh, you know, speaking loosely, we refer to this hot water tank as a thermal mass or a thermal inertia. But using the fundamental analogies we have just developed between mechanical, thermal, and um, electrical systems, I think it's very clear that the expression thermal mass in this context is a misnomer. This is not a thermal mass, this is a thermal capacitor. And yes, the word thermal mass is used in our everyday discussion of you know, thermal storage devices. And that's fine in everyday discussion, that's fine colloquially, but in the context of fundamental analogies, in the context of a Bond graph inspired set of fundamental analogies between mechanical, electrical, and thermal systems, Thermal storage of this kind is called thermal capacitance, not thermal inertia, okay? So that's an example of a thermal capacitor. Now I want to go through an example of a thermal resistor. And uh, before I do that, I want to sort of explore what a resistor really is, what constitutes a resistor. Again, we start with a generalized law for a resistor. A resistor is a device that gives us effort as a static function of flow. It pushes back on us with an amount of effort that is proportional or at least statically related to. It doesn't have to be proportional. It could be nonlinearly related to um, the flow rate that we're trying to, to force through the resistor. So effort is a static function of flow. In a mechanical system, effort is force. Flow is velocity. We want something that pushes back on us with a force that is a static function of velocity and of course a damper gives us that. In an electrical system we want a device that pushes back on us with an effort meaning voltage that is a static function of flow meaning current. So we want a device that gives us voltage that is uh, somehow a, a function of current. So for example voltage is equal to resistance times current. So a resistor in an electrical system it, it is a generalized resistor in the fundamental analogies world. In the thermal system, remember effort was temperature difference or temperature. Uh, so I want a device just like a resistor um, gives me, just like a resistor gives me voltage drop across the resistor as a static function of current through the resistor. I want a, a thermal device such that temperature drop across the device is statically related to the heat flow rate through the device. This static relationship does not have to be a linear relationship. I just want a device such that the heat flowing through the device um, is related to the temperature difference between the two sides or the two ends of the device. Now, interestingly, all of the laws of heat transfer classify as generalized resistive laws in this world of fundamental analogies. Conduction heat transfer, convection heat transfer, radiation heat transfer, they're all driven by temperature difference. And in all of these, heat flow rate is related, is statically related to temperature difference. And so when you think about the hot water tank again, okay, but you think about the fact that this hot water tank could be losing heat to the environment. So now the hot water tank is hotter than the environment and it's losing heat to the environment through let's say convection. So there's a convection heat transfer rate. We know from heat transfer, from the theory of heat transfer, that this convective heat transfer rate, this convective heat transfer flow rate that I'm going to call Q out is equal to a convection heat transfer coefficient H multiplied by a convective heat transfer area A multiplied by the temperature difference between the tank and the outside world, T minus T infinity where T infinity is ambient temperature. This convective heat transfer coefficient may be a function of the velocity of um, you know, the medium uh, that is undergoing convection, so it may be a function of the velocity of the water, the velocity of the air, velocity of the water relative to the air, um, you know, the temperature of the water, temperature of the air. It, it may be a function of a lot of things, but at least on this slide, I'm going to pretend that this convective heat transfer is a constant. 
uh, for simplicity and I'm gonna say well notice how convective heat transfer rate Q out is statically related to temperature difference T minus T infinity so convective heat transfer in the context of fundamental analogies looks like a resistive law okay and what's really interesting here uh, what's really ironic we tend to think of resistors as dissipators that they dissipate heat but in the context of the theory of fundamental analogies a resistor a thermal resistor is a device that transfers heat from one location to another in such a way that this heat flow rate is statically related to temperature difference okay so we've covered the first tutorial goal at this point we've explored fundamental analogies between mechanical electrical and thermal systems um, the next thing I want to do is to look at heat dissipation from the mechanical and electrical worlds and explore the idea that this heat dissipation serves as a coupling effect between the thermal domain and other domains between the dynamics of thermal domains and other domains this is a very simple idea and yet it's an incredibly important idea because it will help us establish multi-domain models of dynamic systems okay so moving on to this um, I want to explore the simple idea that heat dissipation is a multi-domain coupling effect so think of an electrical resistor of resistance R think of the idea that if a current I of T is flowing through this resistor this resistor generates heat losses I squared R losses think about the word losses the, you know when you use the expression I squared R losses what you're saying is that there's a certain amount of, of, of energy over time that is being lost but where is it being lost to it's being lost from the electrical world to the thermal world when you are an electrical engineer interested in building dynamic models of electrical systems only you think of I squared R as a loss but once you become a dynamic systems engineer remember how we said in the first tutorial that system dynamics is really a truly multi-domain multidisciplinary uh, field of study all of a sudden these I squared R effects are not losses anymore they're coupling effects that allow you to build a coupling between different domains in a similar manner think about a, a block that is being pushed along a slippery surface suppose that the block has a velocity V of T and that the contact between the block and the slippery surface can be modeled as a viscous damper of damping coefficient C now of course this viscous damper will exert a force opposing the motion of the block C times V and the force multiplied by velocity which gives you C times V squared is a heat loss okay so we can talk about V squared C losses the same way we can talk about I squared R losses but again um, these V squared C losses the word losses here is 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 sort of a misnomer because in a multi-domain world these V squared C effects are helping us couple the mechanical domain to the thermal domain the bottom line is this heat dissipation from mechanical and electrical systems is a multi-domain coupling effect in, in, once you adopt the more mature perspective that you're a dynamic systems engineer and that you are interested in modeling systems that span multiple domains in a truly interdisciplinary manner okay uh, I, you know one way to think about this is a little bit of a joke but um, many of us have experienced uh, you know the une uh, inexplicable uh, loss of uh, socks when you put them in the laundry and uh, think of the thermal domain as being the domain where the place where the lost socks go basically so every time you do your laundry and you can't find your socks anymore or one half of a pair of socks has gone um, think about those socks as not being lost they've just gone off to another domain through a black hole perhaps they're in a in an alternate universe somewhere perhaps there are agents in that alter alternate universe that are collecting socks and uh, and uh, in the uh, energetic system modeling world the thermal world is where your socks end up um, and uh, they're not lost they're just transported over to an alternate universe um, so with that in mind um, I want to go back to the tutorial goals we've explored fundamental analogies between mechanical electrical and thermal systems We've seen how heat dissipation acts as a coupling effect between thermal dynamics and other domains. The last thing I want to do is to derive a state space model for a very simple thermal system. 
And the particular thermal system that I'm interested in here is a calorimeter. Uh, here's a picture of a calorimeter. I obtained this from Wikimedia Commons, and I uh, appreciate the fact that they make uh, these pictures available. Um, so this picture uh, shows what uh, components of a typical calorimeter are. So a calorimeter is, is a device that is usually very well insulated uh, that allows you to measure properties such as specific heat capacities, uh, you know, latent heats, heats of combustion, and so on of different substances. What you do is you, you seal the calorimeter and you take the material that is inside of it and you either heat it up or cool it down in a controlled manner um, or uh, perhaps you combust it or something and you watch the temperature change, you monitor the temperature change inside the calorimeter and you use that to try to learn something about the material that you're interested in. A very simple schematic of a calorimeter, it's a device that has an internal material that I've shown in orange here um, and a wall that I've shown in green and uh, you know the the wall is usually a very very good insulator um, and uh, there is a uh, resistor uh, perhaps that you're using electrical resistor that you're using to heat up the contents of the calorimeter perhaps because you want to measure their specific heat capacity and uh, perhaps the resistor has resistance R and perhaps what you're pushing through the resistor is a current I of T, which I'm going to label as your input to the calorimeter U1. Okay? Now, uh, normally calorimeters are equipped with uh, mechanisms for stirring their contents because you want to make sure that the contents of the calorimeter are at a uniform temperature so that you're getting a legitimate measurement of what's happening inside a calorimeter. So here I've shown a, st a stirring mechanism. Uh, you know, that you're spinning at an angular velocity omega t, which I'm going to pretend is your second input, control input to the calorimeter U2. And this stirring mechanism, uh, from your perspective as a mechanical engineer, uh, essentially is something that you try to rotate, but it pushes back on you when you try to rotate it. And it acts as a damper, perhaps, and the damping coefficient is C. So the faster you try to spin it, the more it pushes back on you. And what I want to do is I want to develop a model of this calorimeter, okay? The, the calorimeter, if you look at it, it stores energy in one and only one way. It stores thermal energy. I mean, neglecting the kinetic energy that results from swishing the fluid around inside the calorimeter, um, there's really one way that this calorimeter stores energy. However, there are two different distinct com distinct components of the calorimeter that are able to store thermal energy. The material that is inside the calorimeter stores thermal energy and the walls of the calorimeter also store energy. So it makes sense for our state variables to be the temperature of the contents of the calorimeter, that's our first state variable x1, and the temperature of the calorimeter walls separately, that's our second state variable x2. Um, I want to write down state equations for these uh, temperatures and it turns out that it's very easy to write these state equations if you remember the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says that heat into the calorimeter minus perhaps heat out, uh, heat into any control volume in the calorimeter minus perhaps heat out of any control volume of the calorimeter. Heat flow rate in minus heat flow rate out. In the absence of heat generation, okay, uh, in the absence of, let's say, combustion, has got to equal the rate of change of the thermal energy stored in the calorimeter. So what that means, the thermal energy stored inside the contents of the calorimeter is the mass of the contents, M1, I'm going to call it M1, multiplied by the specific heat capacity of the contents, which I'm going to call CP1, multiplied by the temperature of the contents, X1. The rate of change of that is M1 CP1 X1 dot, and that has to equal um, heat flow rate in minus heat flow rate out, okay? Or uh, you can include work in this, in, in this calculation also. Essentially, power in minus power out, where power could also include work being done on the contents of the calorimeter, okay? So what is the power into the calorimeter? What, is the, 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 what are we doing to the calorimeter to add energy to it? To perhaps, what are we dissipating into the calorimeter? Well, um, so I'm looking at the total amount of power into the calorimeter 
including work done on the contents of the calorimeter, including the heat dissipated, perhaps due to the fact that something is trying to do work on the contents of the calorimeter. I'm using these terms very, very loosely. Of course, in thermodynamics, the distinctions between um, you know these terms are much clearer and or or enforced much much more carefully. But basically, the resistor dissipates heat into the calorimeter's content. And the heat dissipation is U1 squared R, where U is the current, U1 is the current flowing through the resistor, so I squared R losses. The mechanical stir is also dissipating heat into the calorimeter. And the rate of heat dissipation is U2 squared C, omega squared times damping coefficient. So that's how much heat the calorimeter, how, that's the heat flow rate into the calorimeter due to dissipation. That is the coupling effect. The calorimeter's contents are also losing uh, heat at a heat flow rate equal to the convective heat transfer coefficient between the contents and the wall of the calorimeter. I'm going to refer to that as H1. The surface area connecting the contents and the wall of the calorimeter. I'm going to refer to that as A1 times the temperature difference between the contents and the wall. Okay, So U1 squared R plus U2 squared C is the rate at which I am literally dissipating heat into the calorimeter's contents. But H1, A1, X1 minus times X1 minus X2 is the rate at which the calorimeter's content them, contents themselves are losing heat to the wall. Okay, The difference between these two quantities divided by mass, divided by specific heat capacity, gives me X1 dot. And that's my first state equation. My second state equation is conceptually very similar. The rate of change of the temperature of the calorimeter wall is equal to 1 over the mass of the wall, which I've uh, denoted by M2 here, times the specific heat capacity of the wall, which I've denoted by CP2 here, times the heat flow rate into the wall from the calorimeter's contents, which is H1, A1, X1 minus X2, minus the heat transfer from the wall to the outside world which is H2, the convective heat transfer coefficient, to the outside world, times A2, the area of contact between the calorimeter and between the outside world and the environment. Um, and then finally, the dif difference in temperature between the wall and the environment, X2 minus T infinity. Okay, I'm pretending here that T infinity is a constant as opposed to an exogenous disturbance. If T infinity varied enough, to serve as a, an exogenous disturbance, I would have declared the ambient temperature as an exogenous disturbance. I would have labeled it as W1, and this would have been X2 minus W1. The point of this exercise is that it's actually very simple to write down state space models of uh, thermal systems. All you need to do is to obey the, the, is to essentially use the first law of thermodynamics in this case. And uh, the first law of thermodynamics actually gives you state equations, state space representations for thermal systems such as this calorimeter. So with this in mind, we've covered the three tutorial goals. We've explored fundamental analogies between mechanical, electrical, and thermal systems. We have seen how dissipation acts as a coupling effect between the dynamics of thermal systems and other domains. And we've derived a state space model for a simple thermal system. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the next tutorial with you. Thank you.